Recording in progress. Good morning to those in the United States. Good afternoon to those in Eretz Yisrael. <coughs> We're continuing the Shir in Chaim Aran and other interesting topics. We dedicate the learning today, Li'ilu Nishmas, Tuvia Rabbi Yisrael Yitzchok, Yerachmiel Daniel Ben Gedalia, and Rosa Basi Tamara, and also Li'ilu Nishmas, my Rebbe, Reb Michal Dorf Mizuchan Avrocho, Rav Yechiel Michal, Reb Yeshua Dovid Alevi, whose yard site is this week on Hay of, and, and Lechvoid Nishmas the Arizal, whose yard site is this week on Hay of. I'd like to devote some time first to speak about these two, and then we'll see the remaining time in Yitzhashim. We'll cover some, some of the Chaim Aran in Yitzhashim. The Ariza lived approximately 500 years ago. His name is Rabbi Yitzchak ben Shloimoi Luria. There's a Pasuk in Tehillim, Oliso Lamoroi Shoviso Shevi. You went up on high, you went to a very high place, and you captured a captive. And this Pasuk is referring to Moshe Rabbeinu going up to Shemaim and bringing down the Torah, which was Prior to that, it was in the hands of the Malachim in heaven. And when Moshe Rabbeinu went to get it, the Malachim put up a fight. They didn't want to release the Torah. They didn't want the Torah to come down to earth. But Moshe Rabbeinu was successful. This Pasuk, the Sforim tell us, is Merames to the different parts of Moshe Rabbeinu's Neshama that came down to this world. First, Moshe Rabbeinu, as we said, then Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochoi. Shevi, the word Shevi is Shimon Bar Yochoi. Then Rabbi Yitzchok ben Shloimoi. Again, Yud Beis Shem, Rabbi Yitzchok ben Shloimoi. And then finally, Rabbi Avram Rabbi Nachman writes, we know that Rabbi Nezal's name, Rabbi Nachman ben Simcha, is Bigimatria, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochoi. And the Arizal, the Sifrei Kabbalah, speak about five parts of the Neshama that are referred to as Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, and then Chaya and Yechida, different levels within the spiritual part of a person. The Arizal tells us that, that a person needs a Zechia to have a Neshama. To have a Neshama is a Schus. And the other levels, Chaya and Yechida, Chaya is an incredible, incredible high level, and Yechido, the Arizal, seems to imply that, that no one will reach that level. Rabbi Nezal said he reached that level and, and went past that. Yechido should be Yechido, etc., etc. And these five that we mentioned, Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi, the Arizal, ah, we skipped the Baal Shem Toy, the Baal Shem Tov HaKodesh, who was known as Rabbi Yisroel Baal Shem. Again, the Yud Beis Shin, the letters Shevi, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem is the fourth one, and Rabbi Nezal being the fifth one of this great connection. The Arizal's father passed away when he was a child. They were living in Eretz Yisrael, and his mother moved to Egypt, where she had a brother who was wealthy, who she understood would be able to support the family. So that the Arizal spent his younger years in Mitzrayim, and over there was Zeche to delve into Torah, into all the different depths of Torah. One of his rabbis was Rabbi Betzalel Ashkenazi, the author of the Shita Mikubetzes, a famous, famous commentary on Shas. And the Arizal climbed to incredible high levels. And at one point he received a message from Shemayim telling him to go to Tzfas, and there he would, he would get to the next levels that he had to get to. And there also he would meet his student, Reb Chaim Vital, whereby the Arizal's mission was to teach this student the secrets of Kabbalah that he had in order for it to be able to, to remain in the world. The Arizal left Herod Yisrael and came to Tzfas, and there there were 
tremendous tzaddikim at the time in Sfas, the Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karoy, Rabbi Meir Alkabitz, who authored the Luchadoidi that we have, the Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Kordoviro, great, great tzaddikim and giants, and the Arizal took his place among them. Then it's brought that the Arizal reached out to Rabbi Chaim Vital and sent him messages. Baruchnius inviting him to come to Eretz Yisrael to study, to learn with the Arizal. Reb Chaim Vital was perfectly content where he was. He was learning, he was growing, and he didn't take the hints until at one point something happened in his life where he realized that he had to do something very, very serious to, to receive the help that he needed. And it was then that he came to Tzfas and tried to go see the Arizal. And at that point, the Arizal pretty much closed the door to him. Reb Chaim Vital understood now that these were the messages that he had gotten before to come and come, which he refused to acknowledge. And because of this, now this obstacle loomed up that the Arizal showed him his rachbus, distancing him. So it's, it's Reb Chaim Vital writes that he went back to the inn where he was staying and he sat down on the ground and he started crying bitterly to Hashem, pleading, begging Hashem, that he realized that, that this, was, this was very, very important for him to be able to meet and connect with the Arizal, and begging forgiveness for the fact that he didn't, he didn't acknowledge this before and he didn't come running earlier. Sure enough, his tefillah was sincere and it was accepted by Hashem, he came to the Arizal, the Arizal said, I fulfilled what I was supposed to do. And now from this point on, I'm telling you that my mission, my main mission in this world is to teach you. And it's brought that Reb Chaim Vital had incredible humility. He couldn't understand, like, why, why me? Why there's other rabbis here that many of, they must be greater than me, etc. Reb Chaim Vital possessed this incredible quality of humility, real sincere humility. And, and once the Arizal told him, the, the Reb Chaim Vital came in and the Arizal stood up. And Reb Chaim Vital was shocked that that wasn't their relationship at all. It was clearly Rebbe's student that the Arizal was the rabbi. And the Arizal told him, I'm standing up for the neshama of Rebbe Akiva, which is with you at this time. And the Arizal told him incredible, incredible secrets about his own neshama, about the different Gilgulim, the different reincarnations he had in the world previously. And the Arizal told him that on, on one of his visits here, he was the Magid Mishnah, who wrote a, a commentary on the Rambam that's very, very well known. And he told him that in that Gilgul, he pretty much completed what he needed to do in Torah Shebenigla, in the revealed Torah. And therefore, now in this Gilgul, he could focus, devote all of his intention to Nistar, to the secrets of Torah, to the study of Kabbalah, which he, which he eventually did. And Reb Chaim Vital saw, he saw the vast difference, again, living in a generation of the giants, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karoy, Rabbi Moshe Kordoviro, these incredible giants, and yet he saw that there was vast, vast difference between the Arizal and them in greatness, that the Arizal was far, far above and beyond all the Rabbonim in, in, in the generation in terms of the fact that Elianovi studied with him regularly and revealed to him incredible secrets of Torah where many, number one, the Zohar HaKadosh, which was authored by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi and his students. Rabbi Abba, who was the main student of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi, besides his son, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon, these two, Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Abba, were the closest students to Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Abba was the one who was given the mission to write down the, the Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi, the Zohar HaKadosh, the Tikkun Zohar, and there are many places in the Zohar HaKadosh which are left un, un, unfinished, unexplained. And in most cases, the Arizal came along and said, then, then they weren't able to reveal this, now we're able to, and I will reveal, I'll continue where they left off, in clarifying incredible secrets in the Zohar HaKadosh. 
So at one point, Reb Chaim Vital asked the Arizal, what made you so different from all these, the great Sadiqim in our generation even? And there were, t- there were several things that the Arizal said, we'll mention two of them. The Arizal said to him, I worked very, very hard. I struggled very hard. Just like Rabbi Nezal made it perfectly clear that the levels he achieved weren't because he was a great grandson of the Baal Shem Tev. He struggled. He worked very, very hard to get to the Madregas that he achieved. Sir Chaim Vital came back and said, so did they. They also worked very hard. These other Sadiqim of the generation also worked very hard. The Arizal said, I worked harder, much harder. And he gave examples. He said, there were times that I would struggle in trying to understand a piece of the Zohar Kodesh, and I'd work on it for days and weeks with, with, with Avoida, all kinds of Avoida. And it seemed to me that I understood it. I got it. And I would go on to something else, and a week later, a month later, it would be revealed to me that I, I did not get the, the right shot to have to go back and work on it again. With fasting, with tefillah, with purification, with mikvah, with all kinds of things that he did to purify himself, to bring himself to higher and higher levels. So this was one point that the Arizal made, that although the other tzaddikim of the generation worked very hard, I worked much harder. Number one, one of the things that the Arizal revealed, which was a, a message that Rabbi Nezal stressed and other tzaddikim, the Ariz, that, that gave him the ability to, to go to such high places, was the fact that he performed mitzvahs with simcha. And the Arizal said that this concept of performing a mitzvah with simcha takes it to a completely different level. He quoted the Pasuk and Tehillim, Sos anoichi alim rosecha kemoitzei shalal rov. Where Dovr Amel says, I was so happy and overjoyed over the mitzvahs of the Torah, like a person who found an incredible, incredible treasure. A person found something worth a hundred million dollars. The joy, the Arizal experienced that every time he did a mitzvah. He would do it with that kind of simcha. Rabbi Nezal has a chapter in Likud Imran, Torah Chav Dalet, chapter 24 in Likud Imran, which is one of the places where Rabbi Nezal reveals what happens, exactly what happens when a person does a mitzvah besimcha, the different levels that are achieved. The Torah, the, 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 the Gemara tells us that the, the, the Pesach says, Ketoyres Shemen Uktoyres Yesamach Leiv that one of the secrets of what made the Torah so powerful, so pointed, so so powerful, is this concept of simcha, that the Torah represents simcha. And over there in chapter 24, Rabbi Nezal goes into major detail explaining this. The Arizal took his students into a cemetery in Tzvaz, and he would go from left, from kever to kever, pointing out this person, was in the world six times. The first time as such and such a person, and because of this and this reason, they had to come back down again as this and this person, and they completed part of their tikkun and did that level of detail in showing his knowledge of neshamos that had passed away, all the different gilgulim, all the different, the, 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 the Gemara writes that Hillel Hazokin had 80 students. His greatest student, was, was Yonas and Ben Uziel, and his smallest student was Rabban Yochanan Ben Zakkai, who ended up becoming the Nasi of Klal Yisrael. And the Gemara says, the Gemara de- describes Yonas and Ben Uziel, his greatness. The Gemara says he was so great that when he studied Torah, there was such a fire generated by his learning that any bird flying overhead would be burned. Kol oif ha-poireach olov, Miyad Nisrof, any bird that fly over him was immediately burned. The Gemara says, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, the smallest of the students, the Gemara says he knew the sikha, he knew the speech, he was able to communicate with Malachim, he was able to communi- communicate with the trees, the languages of the trees and the birds, he knew all the secrets, everything. Reb Chaim Vital writes that what's written about Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai we saw by the Arizo, all of this incredible, incredible knowledge. While we're on this topic, I have a chance to quote 
one of the rare instances that my Rebbe Rav Rosenfeld, Zichron of Rocha, said his own Chiddush on a Gemara. He, he asked the question which others ask. That's how you describe the greatest Talmud of, of uh, Hillel Hazokim, that he, he burnt, he barbecued birds, that any bird that flew over him got burnt. So he, he gave an incredible Chiddush where we know the Gemara says that every mitzvah that a person performs creates an angel. Every Avera that a person performs creates an angel. The mitzvahs create positive angels and the Averas create chas v'shom, prosecuting angels against the person. Among the angels, there are different levels. There are srofim, chayois, oifanim, the Zohar Kodesh and the Sifrei Kabbalah discuss the different levels of malochim. The highest level angel is called a sorof. A sorof, srofim are the highest level angel. Depending on how great the mitzvah a person performs, that'll define how well they do it, it'll define what madrega of angel it creates. So here, when the, the Gemara describes Rabbi Yo, um, Yonis and Ben Uziel, the Gemara says, kol oif ha poireach olav, an oif, the, in, in the Navi, in the Tanakh, we find malachim are called oif. Va oif hashamayim yoylech esakoyl, there are many psukim that refer to the angels as oif, birds, because angels fly like birds. So kol oif ha poireach olav, any bird that flew because of him, olav can mean over someone, and olav also means because of him, through his efforts. Any malach that was created through his mitzvahs, miyat nisraf, the malach was immediately a sorof, it immediately achieved the highest, highest level. Interesting to note that the, the Reb Chaim Vital writes in the introduction to the Kisvi Arizal, <coughs> he writes that even during his time, unfortunately, there were people who questioned who is this person? A, a, a new Rav comes to, the, comes to the city, to the world, and he's revealing these kind of things. He's saying he knows the Malachim and all, all of these things in Shemaim. They were questioning the Arizal's authenticity. And Reb Chaim Vital addresses this in the introduction to the Kisri Arizal. And he writes that for those who are asking these questions, he says the Tana Elokai Rabbi Meir gives the right response to them. Because in Pirkei Avos, in one of the chapters of Pirkei Avos, it begins with the words, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir Oimer, Kol Haloi made Torah Lishma. Any person who studies Torah really properly, Zoyche Lidvorim Harbe will be Zoyche to many things. And then he starts listing some of the Madreidas that the person Zoyche to. He Zoyche to Anava and Yira, and he's Oye Vesamokoim, Oye, he loves Hashem, he loves people, and he is beloved by Hashem, by people. It gives him all the qualities, and they reveal from heaven, they reveal secrets of Torah to him. There's an incredible list of things that the, the mission mentions there. Reb Chaim Vital says to these rabbis, I say, look at this Mishnah, look at yourself, and see, is, is everything that it says there fulfilled in you? If yes, then you know you've achieved this madrega of Torah Lishma. If not, then, then a person has to question themselves. By our Rebbe, by the Arizal, we saw everything listed in that Mishnah and things that aren't listed in that Mishnah, describing the incredible greatness that they saw from the Arizal. Now, the Arizal passed away before he reached 40 years old. And, and it had, had difficulties, Reb Chaim Vital writes, that the Arizal wasn't able to go to the mikveh sometimes in the winter because of health issues. And uh, at one point, again, the Arizal had told Reb Chaim Vital, my main mission in the world is to teach you and, and you, whatever you'll ask, I'll try, to, I'll try to, to give you the answers if I have them. And it was very, very rare that there wasn't an answer. At one point, the Arizal was explaining to him one of the very deep secrets in the Zohar Kodesh, 
And the Arizal said, more than this, we are not allowed to reveal at this point. Rabbi Chaim Vital said, what do you mean? You said you're here to teach me. I, I want to hear everything. The Arizal said, please don't press me. I'm telling you, this should not be learned now. And Rabbi Chaim Vital didn't, didn't realize the danger involved. He kept pressing and pressing. And the Arizal went ahead because the Arizal was told clearly in Hashemayim that this is his mission. The Arizal revealed it to him. And the Arizal made it clear that this was a, a big mistake. This, the following day, the Arizal's son complained he was sick, his head was hurting him, and he ended up passing away. He ended up, the Arizal's son died because of this secret being revealed. And Rabbi Enzal writes that this is one of the things that's very hard that we cannot understand. How on one hand, the Arizal didn't do anything wrong. He was told that this is his mission. And, and yet, sometimes we find Sadiqim suffer because the, the Sotan, the Sahara, fights so hard to block them from being able to reveal what they want to reveal, to be able to help Klal Yisrael. On another occasion, it's brought as a Sefer, Shvoche Ho'arizal, which, <coughs> which Rabbi Nezal, when Rabbi Nezal came to him, Rabbi Nezal saw this Sefer, which obviously wasn't that popular. There weren't thousands of copies printed necessarily. And Rabbi Nezal said, I want, you to, I want you to borrow this, I want you to look through this. And, and Rabbi Nezal went through the Sefer, and then Rabbi Nezal said to him, what, what did you find most important in learning this Sefer? And he said the thing that impressed him most was the humility of Rabbi Chaim Vitalzal. And Rabbi Nezal nodded, that, that's what I wanted you to get. I wanted you to, to get this message to understand that in order for a student to be able to accomplish what he needs to in his relationship with his Rebbe, in order for a student to be able to receive everything he, he needs to get, this is the attribute that's needed. The Gemara says, Pnei Moshe ke Pnei Chama, Pnei Yoshua ke Pnei Levona. That Moshe Rabbeinu was compared to the sun, the student Yeshua was compared to the moon. Just like the moon has no light of its own, the Zohar Kodesh says, the Leslo Migarmo Klum. It has no light of its own, so that it's able to receive and reflect completely the light of the sun, so too a proper student has to be able to put his own mind aside completely in order to be able to receive completely the light of his Rebbe. And this is, this is what Rav Nosan Zal keyed in on because he also had this incredible, incredible quality. One of the stories that's brought, one of the Arizal's Talmudim was Rabbi Avram Halevi. He was called Rabbi Avram Alevi, Rabbi Avram Baruchim, and the Arizal revealed to this student, this student was the one who used to wake up the people in Tzfas for Chatzois, to be able to, to get up every night to mourn the, the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, which the Mekubolim were known to be ex ex exceptionally strong in this area, feeling, feeling the pain of the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, and being mispalil every night for the restore restoration of the Beis Hamikdash, and this Rabbi Avram Alevi, he was the one. He was the vecker, as they say, the one who went around waking people up that, that wanted to be woken up. The Arizal revealed to him that the reason why he was so exceptional in this area was that he's a Gilgal of Yirmiyo Anavi, and just like Yirmiyo Anavi was the one who told the Yidden, who foretold the Churban Beis Hamikdash. That's why he has this in his blood so much, this mission for the Jews to realize the, the loss of the Beis HaMikdosh. And at one point, the Arizal told him that he's about to pass away. Rabbi Avram Alevi is about to pass away. And the Arizal said, if you'll do something, there's a chance that you'll be able to extend your life. So certainly he asked immediately, what is it? The Arizal told him, go to Yerushalayim, go to the Koisal Maravi, and pour out your heart to Hashem there. Plead, beg Hashem for, for, for life. And then you'll see, you'll see if you make the right connection, you'll know that you got this extension. Rabbi Avram Alevi went and he, 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 he believed every word he heard from the Arizal completely. So he did exactly as he was told. And he told over that he went and he fell asleep and he saw a vision of a woman dressed in black 
Kaviyocho the Shechino revealed himself. I, I believe it said walking on top of the Koisel and crying, mourning over the over the Churban Beis Samikdash. And he describes a little bit of what he saw. And when he came back to Tzfas, the Arizal told him, I know, and you should know that you got an extension. I don't remember if it was 22 years, a major extension of life that you'll be able to live because he was zeichet to make this connection with the Shechina. This Rabbi Avram Alevi, who was also known as Rabbi Avram Beruchin, there's a story that on Lag Boimer, the Arizal used to go with his family and his Talmidim to Meiron for Lag Boimer. This, this, this uh, Aliyah to Miron was, was popular at that, time, at, at that time already. And the Arizal celebrated this great Yontif of Lag Boimer. This Rabbi Avram Alevi had a custom to say Nachim, the Tfil of Nachim in Shmon Esrei, which all of us say on Tishabov. We say that Tfil on Tishabov at Mincha we include this paragraph Nachim in the Shmoyin Esrei, in the part about Binyan Yerushalayim. Rabbi Avram Alevi used to include that every day because of his deep connection to Yermi Anovi and to the Churban Beis Hamikdash. And he went ahead and did this also when he was in Miron on Lag Baimer. The Arizal, it's brought that the Arizal was once seen dancing with a tall, very tall person, unusually handsome person, and they, they, they were told afterwards that this was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoyizal, the Mishnah Rosh, that he was dancing with. When this happened, when Rabbi Avram Alevi did this, he said Nachim in Miron on Lag Boimer, the Arizal came to him afterwards and he said, I have a message from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoy, that because you said Nachim on his holiday, we know that the Shulchan Aruch says that on Lag Boimer we don't say Tachnun, all Jews don't say Tachnun. That because you said Nachim, which is a tefillah of mourning, on Lag Boimer, the day that's called the Hilula, the wedding of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi, the great celebration of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi, you are going to receive Tanchumim. People are going to come to console you. And shortly after that, his son, Rabbi Avram Alevi, suffered the loss of a son. And, and this story is brought for us to know, for us to recognize the incredible importance of Lag Boimer, what kind of a holy celebration this is. We know that in recent times, the largest gathering of Jews in the entire world is Lag Boimer in Miron. We know that the religious, the religious element of Klal Yisrael today is a fraction, a small fraction, compared to this 15 or 16 million Jews in the world. I don't know if we have one million Jews that are Shomer Shabbos, Shomer Mitzvahs. And, and yet, the largest gathering in Klal Yisrael is Lag Boimer and Miron. Until recently, there were 500,000, it was going towards three quarters of a million people coming to this small village, Kfar Miron as it's called, to this great Sadiq Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi on the day of his Hilula, the day of his Yorzai. One final story about this student, Rabbi Avrom Alevi, it's brought that one Shabbos, the Arizal was resting. We know the Arizal davened Nates, the Arizal got up for Chatzois. So during the day on Shabbos once he was resting and Rabbi Avram Alevi walked in on him and he was watching him and he saw his lips moving. He saw the Arizal's lips moving. So he understood there was action, there was something going on. And then the Arizal opened his eyes and he, Rabbi Avram Alevi said, Rebbe, can you please share with me what you were learning? The Arizal said to him, for me to share with you a little bit of the secrets that I just learned now about Bullock and Bilam and, and Bilam's donkey would take me 80 years. He wasn't talking to a high school student. He was talking to one of his Talmidim, Rabbi Avram Alevi was one of... He said it would take me 80 years to share with you some of the secrets that I, that's the level of depth that the Arizal received. <coughs> and the Arizal told Rabbi Chaim Vital that his neshama, when his neshama would go up to Shemayim every night, like all of us, when we go to sleep, the neshama leaves the person, he would, he would be fully aware of what was going on 
and he saw, he got to see all the different yeshivas in heaven. And he describes some of the yeshivas that he saw. And he said that he had a pass, an entrance pass, to go to any yeshiva that he wanted. He was welcome in all the different yeshivas. The yeshiva of Mushiach, the yeshiva of this Tana, this Amoira. He mentions that there was, there's a yeshiva of Basio Bas Paroi that has a yeshiva in heaven. He speaks about the different, the Mesifta Derakia, the Mesifta Ilah, two incredible high-level yeshivas in heaven. One is a yeshiva, which is referred to as a yeshiva of the angels, Mesifta Derakia, where there, there is still a concept of debate, in a sense. There's, just like we have in Mishnayis, kosher posel tomei tohar osur mutter. But he said there's a higher yeshiva than that, the Mesifta Ilah, which is Kaviochel, the yeshiva of Hashem himself, where there there's no debate at all. There there's all oneness, all achdus, oneness, complete oneness. We'll hold it over here for now regarding the Arizal. Any questions, please? Rabbi? Yes. on it earlier when we said that that Rabbi Nezal said that and Rabbi Nezal is alright that, that we can't really understand this completely why it is that on one hand Hashem loves these tzaddikim more than anybody else and Hashem wants them to spread Torah etc and why is it that in doing this the, the Sahara battles them with everything he has and is able to cause illness, suffering different types of suffering I want to read uh, just two lines. There's a chapter in Likutei Alochis, Rav Nosson's house, Likutei Alochis, in Yoridea, Hilchis, Yoridea, the first volume of Yoridea, Hilchis Beitzin, Halacha Dalet. It's a famous chapter in Likutei Alochis where Rav Nosson's house speaks about the Churban Beis Hamikdash, about mourning, <coughs> and he, he, he says there, Yefshir Lashum Adam. Bichlal u Bifrat Lovoi el Hatikva Toivo Kiim Alide Tsar Visurim Umerirus Godol. It's impossible for any person in general and specific to get to the real salvation, to get to the true hope, the true Yeshua, without suffering pain and great bitterness. We know the Gemara says in the beginning of Brochus, the Gemara says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoyzal said that there are three things that are acquired through suffering, Yisurim, which are Eretz Yisrael, Torah, and Olam Haba. That's the wording of the Gemara. And he brings Psukim, a Pasuk, for each one to show that it requires Yisurim, going through suffering. Now, and, and, and Rabbi Nelson Zal writes, this suffering, one form of this suffering is mourning, Avelus, especially like the Avelus over the destruction of the Beis Amikdash. He writes, Avul gam umemaren However, even when we're mourning and expressing our bitter pain over the destruction of the Beis Amikdash, Voho Iker, and the most important focus when we're doing that is the realization, what does it mean that there's no Beis HaMikdosh? 
it means that we are much more distant from Hashem than they were in those days. The Gemara tells us a person would come to the Beis Hamikdash, they would bring a korban, and they would know that their sin was erased. Nowadays, we don't have Beis we don't have korbanos. The Gemara says that a Jew's table, when a person eats properly bigdusha, that serves in place of a korban. And the tefillos that we have today, our prayers, are in place of the korbanos. But there's no question that it was a completely different level then. The Gemara says that people, a person was able to see Hashem in the Beis Hamikdash. How do you see Hashem? By the fact that there were miracles going on on a constant basis. Ten miracles that are described in Pirkei Ovois going on in the Beis Hamikdash at all times. So the, the level of emun in Hashem, the level of closeness to Hashem, the level of das, the highest body, this, the, the supreme court of Klal Yisrael, the Sanhedrin Agdoila, sat in the Beis Hamikdash. The Oroin, the, the Ark, the Holy Ark that had the original Luchais, the two sets of Luchais, the first set of Luchais that Moshe Rabbeinu broke, and the second set of Luchais that were given to Moshe Rabbeinu were both in the Beis Hamikdash. So the Beis Hamikdash was a center of Das, number one. It radiated knowledge, recognition of Hashem. It broadcasted recognition of Hashem to the whole world. And in addition, it was the ultimate center of tefillah. The Pesach says, Ki oiloiseyem v'zivcheyem l'rotzen al mizbechi. They brought korban ola and other korbanis on the mizbeach. Ki beisi based tefillah yikori l'chol amen. Because Hashem said, my house was the base tefillah, the ultimate center of tefillah. We know that today, all of our prayers that we say people all over the world have to make two stops before they go up to Shemayim. They have to go to the Kaisel Marovi, to the place where the Beis Samikdash was, and also to the Mora Samachpela, where we have Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, the founders of the basic tefillahs. So, so now that we don't have the Beis Samikdash, we need to know that we are in a completely, completely different, lower level than they were in those <coughs> generations. And as every year goes by, this far and right, every year goes by that we're further away, another year away from the time when we had the Beis Hamikdash, the generations get lower and lower. The light becomes more and more diminished. So Rav Nosanzal says, Vo'ikr, when we're mourning during this period, especially now, Rosh Chodesh Ov was Friday, today is Sunday, we're going through the nine days now, we're mourning the Churban Beis HaMikdash. Rav Nosanel says the most important thing that we're mourning is our distance from Hashem that we're experiencing now in this Golos. So he says, Gamoz Osur Lehishoyer Bozer Chas Vashon. We're not allowed to stay in that state of sadness and mourning and feeling terrible but rather, we have to console ourselves all the time with the great hope that we hope for a good ending. As much as we're going, we're going through suffering, all different types of suffering, there's hope. We know that we, it's, go, it's going to have a happy ending. We're going to get out of this golos, this exile. From thick darkness to great light. As it says in Eicha, we know that on Tisha B'av we read Eicha, and Eicha is the saddest book in the, in the written Torah, the saddest Megillah in, in the written Torah, where Yirmiya Novi foretells what's going to be about the, the, the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash and the great suffering then. But in Eicha itself, in the third chapter of Eicha, where Yirmi Anavi begins, Ani Hagever Ro'oni, I am the person who witnessed suffering. And he describes the darkness and the pain and everything. And he says there, at one point, I thought that there's no hope, that there's mamish no hope. It looked like it's all over. But he said, but I, I remembered and I remind myself all the time, Chazde Hashem ki loisomnu ki loicholu that Hashem's kindness is infinite. And even when there will be destruction, even when there will be pain and suffering, we know, we believe, 
that this, it's all going to have a happy ending to it. And that's why, again, the last lines of Eicha, Al hoyo dovo libeinu, al eile choshcho eneinu, for this our hearts were sad and our eyes were, were dark, lacking in light. Al hartzion sheshomeim, over the Mount Zion, which is completely desolate. Shualim hilchu boy, foxes walk where the where the where the Kodesh Hakadoshim was, but then it finishes. Hashivenu Hashem elechov and Ashuvo chadei shemenu kikedem, expressing the fact that we know we believe one hundred percent that the Jews are going to do tshuva. We are going to do tshuva, and Hashem is going to renew chadei shemenu kikedem. Hashem is going to bring back the Beis Hamikdash. He's going to bring back that incredible great light that existed at that time. Any other questions, please? There is the concept in, in the, the world to come that we can learn in yeshiva, and there's an idea of we can continue, we're going to continue to grow. There's this idea, in other words, of there's no idea of sameness. In other words, there's, con- there's growth that we can look forward to. God willing, we could be in that situation to be in a yeshiva. Is that correct? Yes, hopefully. If a person is privileged to make sincere effort to come close to tzaddikim in this world, then the person can, can be assured that in the next world also, they'll have the privilege the tzaddikim will be able to, to bring us into those yeshivas where they are. Yes. Can I ask for some, for some clarity on that question? Sure. Very interesting question because I always understood that, like, yeah, you know, we, you know, when we have a yard site, we make brachas for, for people or we convince us for people because they cannot grow. They, they, they kind of need us down here to, to elevate the, their, themselves. So is the, is the learning that we do in the, you know, Gan Eden, in, 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 in Lama Ba, uh, is that a, a learning of growth or what is it? Good question, good question. There's a posuk, Bamesin Chofshi, that when a person passes away, they're free. They are freed from their obligations, meaning they can no longer perform mitzvahs as they were able to during their physical lifetime. It's brought that the Vilna Goim, before he was about to pass away, was crying, and his students looked at him. They knew he wasn't crying because He felt he didn't fulfill his obligations in this world. They knew he devoted himself completely to Torah and mitzvahs. So they asked, what are you crying about? You're not crying over the fact that you're worried that you didn't serve Hashem. He said, I'm crying over the fact that I'm leaving a place where for $5, a person can buy a pair of tzitzis, a person can acquire tzitzis and put on tzitzis, which includes all 613 mitzvahs. The Gemara shows the word tzitzis is 600, and the eight strings and the five double knots is 613. A person who wears tzitzis properly, it's as if they're fulfilling all 613 mitzvahs, and I'm going to a place where you can't can't do that anymore. That's true on one hand, and that's why when we go into a cemetery, we're careful not to show our tzitzis. Because the halacha says it would be like we're, make, we're, in, we're making fun. We can do the mitzvah and you can't. That's true. And that's why on a yard site we make brachas and, and we say we're, we're learning mishnayas le'ilu nishmas to elevate the souls of those who passed away. However, the Gemara also says about tzaddikim that just like they have no rest in this world, they have no rest in the next world, in the future world. They keep going higher and higher. <clears throat> Now the question, one question that Rab Nosson Zal asks in the Kuti Alochas, Rab Nosson establishes a very important point in chapter 22 in the Kuti Imran, that in order to go up, you must go down. There must be a Yerida before an Aliyah. Just like when Hashem created the world. There's darkness first, and then there's light. And Rab Nosson makes this perfectly clear. The question is, how do Tzadikim in Gan Eden, how can they have an Aliyah? Where's their Yerida? <laughs> and one of the examples that Rav Nosson Zal gives there is that when we here on earth visit the Kever of Eitzadik, when we go there, and we go there 
to, to daven there or to learn there in the presence of the holiness of this tzaddik, the part of the neshama, the part of the nefesh of the tzaddik that's found at the kever, the tzaddik comes down. And in fact, while we're on the topic, <coughs> I believe Rabbi Nizal, the Arizal revealed this secret that when a person goes to a cemetery, they go to visit a kever of a grandparent, any, whoever it is, how can, how can you be sure that that person, that neshama knows that you're there? They're somewhere up in Gan Eden, that they're, they're busy doing their thing. So the, I believe it's the Arizal who reveals that in a cemetery, there are always some neshamas that are present. Because these neshamas cannot perform mitzvahs the way they were able to during their physical lifetime, if you offer them an opportunity to share in a mitzvah, they'll jump at it. So if the person takes out a coin or a dollar or a shekel and says, I'm going to give this tzedaka on behalf of any neshamas that are present here who will go inform Rabbi Chiel Michal, Rabbi Shua David Alevi. They'll go inform this person, my Rebbe, my, a, a grandparent, a parent, whoever it is, that I'm here, I'm visiting their kever, and I would like their neshama to be present. These neshamas, you don't have to yell or scream. They hear, they hear, and they run to have an opportunity to share in a mitzvah. You're giving tzedakah on their behalf. They run to find, to locate that neshama, to inform them. And if it's at all possible, that neshama comes down to be present at the time that the person is there saying the Tehillim or learning there at the time. And this is one of the examples of how the neshama of a tzaddik even can come down, has this yurida. They're coming down, and from this <coughs> yurida comes a, a, an incredible aliyah, an incredible aliyah, just like because they're coming down to help us. We who are down in this world, who want to, who want to, to come close to Hashem, and in our efforts to come close to Hashem, we're going to the kever of a tzaddik because we believe that that's a place where the tefillahs are stronger, and, and to solicit the help, the assistance of that tzaddik in our tefillahs being received by Hashem. It's like a person who is Tomei during the time of the Beis HaMikdash, a person who is Tomei, and the Koyen Godel would sprinkle the ashes of the Paraduma on that person. The person who is Tomei, even the most severe kind of Tomei, a person who came into contact with a dead body, where they're Tomei for seven days, they become purified in the process. The one who's involved in the, pr in the process of, of the, the ashes, handling the ashes of Paraduma, becomes slightly Tomei in the process. They become Tomei Tomas Erev, till evening, till nightfall, they become Tomei. And Rav Nosan Zal equates this in Likut HaLochais to the Tzadikim who make an effort to come down to us, to <coughs> purify us. In coming down, there's a slight, slight Yerida. It's a Yerida for them, in a sense. But this Yerida results in an incredible Aliyah. By doing this, they purify us from the most severe tumor. And in doing that, they experience an incredible Aliyah. So this is one of the ways Sadiqim cannot perform mitzvahs physically like they did in this world, putting on tefillin, mezuzah, what, what, eating coat. But, but they can share, number one, they can share in, in bringing us close to Hashem. And the Zohar Kodesh makes it perfectly clear that whatever a tzaddik was involved in during his lifetime here on earth, he continues to be involved up in Shamayim in that same type of mission. So those tzaddikim who while they were physically living here on earth were involved in bringing people close to Hashem, after they pass away, they're able to continue doing that from there, in the ways that they can, through their tefillahs, through their efforts. The, again, the Arizal explains, there's a concept of Gilgal, a tzaddik, coming back to the world, into this world, into a physical body, in order to complete certain things, to achieve a higher, higher elevation. Or sometimes there's something called Ibur, where you have a person on earth who has the opportunity to do a mitzvah, but they don't have the complete desire. They have 50% desire to do the mitzvah. Their desire isn't complete. You have an ashama of a tzaddik in Ganeitin who has 6,000% desire for a mitzvah, 
but doesn't have the physical means of doing it. These tzaddikim are given permission to come down and enter into a person and give the person that rocket fuel that they need, that rot sign to do the mitzvah, and in the process, they share in the rewards of the mitzvah, the benefits of the mitzvah. The person who physically performed the mitzvah gets a certain credit for it. The neshama of the tzaddik that was nisaber, it entered into the person, also gets tremendous benefit. And again, this is yerida letzayra chalia, coming down to this world in order to achieve a major elevation. Thank you. I see in the chat a mention was made to add a Rafu Shalema for Chana Bas Esther, Rafu Shalema. And we also mention all those that are close to us, all those that need a Rafu Shalema, especially Ruven Chaim ben Chana Elka, Yusbehendel Bas Gitleya, Sorocho Bas Yusbehendel, Chavi Vachana Bas Galia, Shimon Zvulun ben Soraleya, Soraleya Bas Chavaliba, Idis Bas Miriam Brindel. And all those that we usually mention, I don't have the list in front of me, all those that need refuas should have refuas and Yeshua's that all of us need. I just, we have a few minutes. We didn't do justice. Maybe in the, in the shirim that the shir will give tomorrow, we'll include more about my Rebbe, Reb Michal, Zichron Ebrecha, but just to, to mention a little bit a, a, a message that we can take for ourselves. He mentioned that he was born in the city of Chemerovitz, which is Polish Russia. It was one of those cities that changed, depending on the ruler at the time, whether it was under the, under the authority of Russia or Poland. And in the city, there were two Rabbonim, two major Rabbonim at the time. One was <coughs> his father, who was a Rav in the city, and the second one was another rabbi. And he said that they both conducted themselves in different manners. The other rabbi wore a long coat that went almost down to his ankles, and when he walked in the street, he walked slowly like, an, a, 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 like certain rabbis walk, an elderly rabbi walking slowly, calmly. He mentioned that his father, Reb Michal's father, also wore a long coat, but just a little bit below the knee, and when he walked in the street, you couldn't keep up with him. He was quick, zri, you know, tremendous zrizis, tremendous youthfulness. And his father taught him when he was a child, when he was 10, 11 years old, he was teaching him Yoridea, the laws of Shechita, the laws of Kashrus. <clears throat> and he said his father showed, his father was in charge of the Shechtim in the city, the ones who slaughtered me. His father showed him how to do the Bedika of the lungs to put his hand inside the lung to be able to check for sirchas and escapes, things like that, at a young age. He mentioned that they were extremely, extremely poor. The, the place that they lived in had a dirt floor, no cement floor or anything, a dirt floor, and the walls of the house during the winter, they, they wasn't, would be dripping, dripping with, from wetness of the freezing cold. Of the, and he says, because of that, his mother contracted rheumatism, uh, uh, like a, type, a severe type of arthritis, and, and he remembers seeing her in pain, tremendous pain from the bones, you know, experiencing tremendous pain as a result of this. And she ended, ended up passing away from this rheumatism. And he said that, that they were very, very poor. His father refused to accept anything and he, there are some places where the shaykhtim pay the rav, they give the rav a stipend in order to support him. He refused to accept any money from the shaykhtim so that he shouldn't be affected in any way, that he should be able to remain 100% s strict in, in the laws in supervising the shaykhtim if they were doing the, the, a proper job or not. One time on Erev Yom Kippur, the, the, the family was having the Suda Masekes, the, what you eat before Yom Kippur, before the fast, and somebody came into the house unexpectedly to ask the Rav, a Shiloh, to ask his father a question. And they saw that they were eating moldy bread. That, they didn't have anything else to eat at the time. They were eating moldy bread to prepare for the fast of Yom Kippur. This person saw this, he was in shock, and he went back and told the, the heads, the leaders of, of the city at the time, this is what a rav, this is what the rav is eating, this is what he's living on. 
And from that point on, they insisted, they forced them to accept a certain stipend in order to be able to live. <clears throat> he mentioned that, that, that um, they, they were living under communist Russia, the communist revolution <clears throat> took place around 1917. <clears throat> and this was during the 1920s and 30s, early 30s. And when the Nazis came in, his father thought can't be any worse than the Russians, can't be worse than the communists. So some of the people fled, some of the people ran away when there was an opportunity to run away. His father thought that it'll be better, they'll be better under the Nazis than, than, than under the communists. Unfortunately, when Nazis came in, they showed more brutality, more hate towards Jews even than the communists. And his father, they said, <clears throat> for you we, we have something special because you're a rabbi. They had him dig his own grave and they buried him alive. That's how his father passed away. How Reb Michal came to Breslov when he was a, when he was a, a teenager, 14, 15 years old at that time, he was learning in a yeshiva in Kiev, an underground, this is during communist times, an underground yeshiva, meaning you weren't allowed to have any yeshivas. And he mentioned there were two yeshivas at that time in Kiev. There was a Labavitch yeshiva called Taim Chet Mimim, and there was a Klal Hasidi, a general a yeshiva for different types of Hasidim. His father was not Breslov, but he was a Hasidish Jew, and his father sent Reb Michal and his younger brother to this Klal Hasidi yeshiva. At one point, Reb Michal was thinking of coming home for a holiday, and his father sent him a letter and cut out an article from a newspaper, a local communist newspaper, where they wrote there in this newspaper, they wrote, how do we allow such a filthy, low life, a rabbi, <clears throat> and they mentioned his father by name, <clears throat> to walk on the soil of Mother Russia, on the soil of our motherland, our motherland, our fatherland. <clears throat> and his father sent him this article in order for him to, to consider whether to come home or not, whether it was safe to come home or not. He got the message and he decided instead he had heard about the Breslov or Hasidim, he had heard about Uman, and he figured he'll go check it out, he'll go there. And he mentioned he traveled to the city of Uman at the time, and he came there, he asked the people there, where is Rabbi Nachman's kever? And they took him there, they showed him. And he mentioned that he had hishtatchus. Hishtatchus means when a person prostrates themselves completely over a kever, and he cried for three hours, crying and crying. He said from when he was a child, he was a baldechi. It came easy for him to cry. <clears throat> and he was crying over his predicament and everything. And he said when he finished crying, he had a feeling that he just established a new home, a new home for himself, that this is gonna be his new family and his new home. He ended up staying there, and sure enough, when he was 16 years old, Rebbe Avram Sternhartz saw him and saw, so obviously saw something very special in him, and he wrote a letter to his son, Rebbe Nassen Sternhartz, saying that a young man has come to Uman, <coughs> They say he's a descendant of the Shpala Zeda, and he's a Yerei Shemaim, he's somebody of high quality, and I think this could be a very good shirach for your daughter, my granddaughter, Rabbi Avram Shterahas' granddaughter. Sure enough, he ended up marrying his granddaughter and went through a lot, this, a lot of, lot of suffering under the communists. He spent six years and seven months in Siberia, but, but eventually, like, like in Echo he said, eventually, Communism fell, Stalin died, and, and communism ended up falling. He came out of the Soviet Union, he came to Eretz Yisrael, he came to Yerushalayim, and took his position there among the elders of Breslov in the, in the main yeshiva and shul in Yerushalayim, and eventually ended up leading the koilo there and leading the shul, beautifying the shul in many different ways, and was Zoycha to be buried on Har Azesim. His yard site is Hayov, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to be in Eretz Yisrael, but I know that there's a, a bus being organized of people on Hayov to go to Har Azesim to visit the kever of Reb Michal Zichron of there. He's buried in a chelka of Breslov, where there are many other Breslover rabbis that are buried there. Rav Rosenfeld, Rav Levi Bender, 
Reb Shmuel Shapiro, Zechon Rebrocha, it's a whole breast of the there. And many of the people go on from there to Tzfas, to the Arizal, to the Ar- which is also on Hayov. We should be Zorcha that all of its Tzadikim should join together to help us get out of this darkness, out of this Golos, and to turn these nine days into, into days of celebration, to celebrate the Gaula Shlema with the coming of Moshiach and Herod the Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen, Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Nassim. Sure. Any questions before we close? Amen. May I ask a quick question, Rav Nassim? Okay. Since we're on the topic, mm-hmm. the question is, Rav Rosenfeld, I want to show him, he, from what I understood, was a very, um, very communist Russian. He'd always make his way to Uma. And a friend of mine wanted me to ask Rav Nassim, um, uh, what do we do today? Because we have these bullies again, these horrible people. Like, uh, Okay, I'm not going to answer. Sure. Can the rabbi just uh, give the, a short uh, the, the, opinion on this? The, the answer is we pray very, very hard that the people who are going there on a constant basis now, a close friend of mine is leaving 4 o'clock this afternoon, Amir Tzashem, to, to Uman. And there's a group going from the Muncie area, from New York, are going tomorrow. <clears throat> there are people now going on a constant basis they're not going the same way people went in recent years. There's the Kiev airport isn't available. The Odessa airport isn't available. They're going to countries that are close by <coughs> and then using ground transportation to travel to Oman. So far, Baruch Hashem, in recent months, no one has been hurt. All the people that went there came back safe and well. And in most cases, they said that there weren't problems. They were able to get through the border crossings, etc. It's it's diff- it's more difficult than a direct flight than what it was in recent years, but they were able to go. We're hoping, we're hoping and praying that it'll be safe for the breast of the Hasidim to be able to go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah this year, and that that the Rosh Hashanah will accomplish everything that Rabbi Nezal said it could accomplish. Rabbi Nezal said that there's nothing more important for us than coming to him for Rosh Hashanah, being with him for Erev Rosh Hashanah and the two days of Rosh Hashanah, hoping to be there. Thank you, Rav. So the, the Breslov Rabbanim, they, they made a decision yet, or they're making a decision? I, I've heard some different opinions. I don't know if there's a unanimous opinion, but the the general general attitude that I've seen is a, a positive one, Baruch Hashem. That's when I'd like to give you a bracha. You should be in the clear to go there safely and return safely to Uman for this Rosh Hashanah. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.